Good evening, everybody. A special good evening to our distinguished guests, to our poets, staff, faculty, and everybody listening online. Thank you for your patience as we embark on this wonderful evening of poetry. And we're going to start properly with Omandi Byron doing the national anthem. Please stand if you can. You may have your seats. I am so happy we thought it appropriate to give him a round of applause. Let's do that again. Because if you follow the program, you realize his presentation was quite impromptu, relevant, and reliant because he knows the national anthem. Multi-skilled, and so he could just come up and perform. And that is excellent. <laughs> Might I add the best part about him is that he's an educator. You know, that's my favorite part about everybody. He's a teacher. He's a good teacher. And he can traverse sectors, so he's quite competent and reliable to hold the music education up and then come over and hold the culture of St. Kitts and Nevis up and the music of St. Kitts and Nevis up. You see how awesome teachers are? I can tell you how awesome we be for the whole night, okay? <laughs> so welcome, welcome to this night, this evening this occasion of poetry, and it's so beautiful to see everybody here in the hallowed halls of CFBC, where we continue to strive for excellence. Excellence is not achieved in isolation, but it is when our community and partners from different sectors come and thrive with us and celebrate with us. Thank you very much for being here. You all look beautiful, and I hope to be inspired by your spoken word. I hope to be enjoyed by your journeys. Enjoyed? I hope to enjoy your journeys and be enjoyed. That's creative licenses. 
That is creative license, okay? Because you could say those kind of things when you speak in the word. Allow me to acknowledge and establish the protocol and acknowledge Miss Dorothy Warner, the Director General of the UNESCO's World the Secretary General of the St. Kitts Nevis National Commission for UNESCO, and a teacher. <laughs> Mr. Francil Morris, Chief Education Officer, and a good, good teacher. Mrs. Ioni Leibard Willett, former interim president of the CFBC College. It's a teacher too, right? I could tell. Participating poets, musicians, viewing and listening audience, welcome. Unfortunately, our board chair is not able to be here this evening. However, she sends her regards and she sends a piece for us to hear a piece of what she had to say. Right, Pension? So I'm going to give you a little piece of her piece. And it's about forgiveness and forgiving me and whoever she needed to forgive. And so it goes. I forgive you the slurs and insult. I love you. I embrace you. I hug my sodomy, my incest, my black eyes and broken spirit, I love you. The ones who thought I would be nothing. I kissed the hands that slapped me and held my throat to squeeze the life right out of me. I kiss your hands. Forgive me for forgiving you and loving you. Forgive me for allowing you to Grind me into dust. I forgive me. I love me. I forgive you because it's time to forgive me. Pen by our cheer lady of this Clarence Fitzroy Bryant College Board, Dr. Tamu Brown. So there was some hallowed forgiveness in Jesus' name. Do we have Miss Knight with us as yet? Miss Knight? Oh, I didn't even recognize you. We'll call you to the podium, Miss Knight. You know he's number one. Come. Come. Say your piece. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I asked to move up early because I was not feeling well. But it was just stage fright. <laughs> so I will feel much better after I'm done. <laughs> um, I picked a piece and then realized I wrote it a decade ago. And then realized I could say those words and that I'm getting old. So I decided to write something new about the generational curses that I have inherited. Those uh, blindness, dementia, Alzheimer's, and ambition. I think my family has been cursed with ambition. We will our children with the weight of our dreams, and that inheritance is heavily taxed. I want nothing more than a life with you, a dog, a home that's painted in laughter every Christmas and where the floorboards are polished with joy in the spring. I need vanilla in the kitchen, fresh fruit in the dining room, and kisses on the way out the door, but please come with me. I need to hold your hand when the sense of nostalgia for the home we were in just 30 minutes ago makes me cry. 
because I think about the way my grandfather held my hand and made me promise him I'll affix my name to something great. He still regrets in his blind old age, never realizing the gift of his vision, not using his once good legs to follow his dreams. He'd beg God for one good day of youth and health to do some good in the world for, oh, of course, his favorite little girl. And he tells me how his perfect stroke of luck landed him in a perfect family with paintings of tigers on the walls and 10 gifted children and a life spent providing and protecting and piano music. He tells me, my darling, you can still see. And he feels for my hands and my face and he says, my darling, don't be as blind as me. And I want to tell my grandpa that I want to fix my name to yours, that my childhood master plan doesn't fulfill me anymore. Someday soon I'll be happy as you, I want to tell him. But he's old and confused. And he'll only cry at the thought of a love he can't really remember, that he mentioned just 30 minutes ago. He can see but can't see. He knows, but he won't know. He still loves, but no longer dreams of, because he sleeps like a child that left home for the first time. He's only safe from the nightmares in castles of his mind, and I was raised to keep watch over our delusions of grandeur. But why? These haunted halls were never home to you, nor he, nor I. Thank you. Be very careful when you are preparing the will. Notice she, what she said she got from her family, ambition. Be very careful. And blindness. I was trying to be nice, I was trying to be nice, ambition. So those of us that want ambitious children, be mindful of the weight of it. And remember your responsibility to teach us to carry it. Now we'll call to the honorable podium, Dr. Hugh James. I heard he did a piece about love one time ago. I hope this is a love poem again. Good evening, everyone. Because of the work that I do, I have to provide a lot of motivation. So I motivate people a lot. And so I have titled this poem, The Motivation Chant. So um, it's designed and intended to motivate persons to, you know, who are trying to reach their aspirations and accomplishments, whether it's in education or in whatever area of endeavor. So the motivation chant. Motivation, motivation. I have some goals that I must achieve and I do believe that I can perform. I keep on trying to understand that I need to have more self-control. I came here with a desire to learn and I like the way that you make me feel. I'm taking my time but I must decide I'll be satisfied when I've done my best. Motivation, motivation. Where? am I heading? How do I get there? What am I good for? How can 
I improve? What, which, when, where, how, and why? Who has the answers for me? How do I behave? What is my attitude? What do I need to know? How must I find out? What type of person am I? How well do I get along with everyone? How much freedom do I have? What is my responsibility? How high do I climb? Who is the greatest to see? Motivation. Motivation. Setting goals, aiming high. Planning well, managing time. Human beings, living gems. Treasure, value, beauty, strength. Brain power, deep thinking, blending mind. I'm going to finish this one later. Now, the, this one that I plan to do today from the start, a friend left behind. We thank the Lord for modern days. Although they come with modern cares. But when you think of the things left behind, it leaves a wonderful impression on the mind. The faithful latrine was such a thing giving you the best privacy that even money could bring. It served us well for a long, long time. And to operate it, well, it costs hardly a dime. Whether the water been on or off, to carry on your business was no big task. You need no tanker water or toilet brush. And no flushing device, there was no need for such. But Lord at night, he'd been too far from the house. It was a real challenge for even a mouse. Thanks to the poor and the pale for helping us out. Them been real good friends without a doubt. But boy, I've been hearing them cockroach like soldiers on the move, marching back and forth like they had something to prove. You had to employ the skill of an acrobat and stay on your feet. With knee bending, them creatures you had to beat. You had to be careful, for if you slip one bit, you might end up somewhere, somewhere in the bottomless pit. So you see, the latrine been both good and bad. And to leave it behind was so sad. But to tell you the truth, if I had to choose, on this easy decision, no sleep I would lose. I would go for my first toilet any day. Because this going back and forth just can't pay. know what a latrine is, an old house, know what it is. Because I know. Yeah, man. Outside and you're free to go inside in the night and you leave the tin in door open so you can run out just in case. Okay, <laughs> Miss, Miss Warner, so you had door. So maybe I had like a luxury one. <laughs> Maybe I had a luxury one with a roof and so, like a little tin and thing to the back of the house. Yeah. I know so. Oh, but for grace, I have come this far. In Jesus' name. <laughs> okay, the evening has been going quite well. And now we're going to call Mrs. Dorothy Warner, Miss Dorothy Warner, to deliver a message for us. adjust this thing you know but I hope I don't destroy it. Good evening all. Good evening. Let me yes, um, adopt the protocol that was ably established earlier and just say general good evening to all and welcome. Normally when I'm invited to this event I would read the director general's message but for some reason or other the message didn't come as well as it ought to have come this year so I had to pen my own. 
And that's a part of the creativity that you will see coming out in me as a teacher myself. Um, so I want to basically thank the poets here and those we have all around us and look to them for the inspiration that we need every day to make sure that we have a wonderful time. They, so during the time I was planning to celebrate World Teachers Day as the Secretary General for UNESCO, I engaged four local poets to basically share merits of poetry and some of their own poetry, local poetry, with the Federation. I engaged Ms. Jehan Williams, Mr. Lesroy Williams, Mr. Quyton Pension, and Mr. Hansel Manners. And they agreed to partner with us to share some of their poetry and, of course, extol the merits of poetry on radio. They did a broadcast. They recorded it yesterday, and it was beamed through all the media houses during the course of today. So I want to thank those four poets. I see three of them here. Can we just give them a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. And so now I want to basically capture a bit of what their presentations on the radio, on the media, said to us. The theme for this year's um, celebration of poetry, World Poetry Day, is always be a poet, even in prose. And from Jehan Williams' presentation, she said, poetry is free expression of thought and of who we are. We should not be bound to rhythm and rhyme, and it's not just about entertaining, but for her, her poetry challenges us. And she says, to say the things, we have to say the things that we are scared of saying, and to do away with the fear that some of us have that our poems won't be accepted. And generally speaking, she wants to, for us to be courageous in doing our own poetry. She says that she's not just a poet, she's so many other things, and that makes her indefinable, and I love that. Mr. Pension, he did a, a history of the World Poetry Day, and he was able to set up poetry captures the spirit of creativity and of the human mind, and he has the power to lift the human spirit. We, he too talks about our not being bound by the literary devices and the conventions of poetry. Because you talk about prose, you talk about poetry. Most of us know um, poetry to be strict with lines and rhythm, etc. But they're inviting us to go out of that box now and to use poetry even in prose. And we love that. Um, he said we should be free to write, not what we think, but what we feel, and make it have a natural flow. We should rekindle and renew our interests for the art form. He also talks about vomiting our fear of poetry. And that is very metaphoric, yes? And he charges us and challenges us to improve our lives and our individual and collective lots with his poem called You. I wish he would do that one tonight. I love that. You didn't bring that one? Yeah. <laughs> I loved it so much. Thank you very much for that. Mr. Williams. He says he learned to write as a poet early in life, and he poetry expresses who he is and expresses his feelings. Poetry shouldn't be sophisticated and, and, and complicated. It should be just easy to understand. So many poems, he said, used to hurt his head just to understand them. You know, they have those deep lines. Poetry is very deep. And in order for you to understand what the poet is saying, you have to have a certain level of experience to be able to pull out of the poems what they really mean, because the lines are short, but they are deep. So we understand what you're talking about. He talks about being free to express himself. And in his poem, I Am a Bird, <laughs> that he did this morning, he talks about having no limitations in his poetry and being able to fly. Mr. Manners expounded, did quite a bit of research, Mr. Manners, thank you, on the theme of um, being a poet, even through prose, did quite a bit of research there, and talks about the contradictory nature of the topic, of the theme, prose and poetry. But he also talks about not limiting ourselves within traditional forms and opening up to embrace our creativity, to broaden the scope of poetry, and to appreciate poetry in all its forms of writing. Thank you for that. Doing away with our inhibitions and our fears, again, they're all saying, don't be afraid. You know, Even if what you think you're writing doesn't qualify as poetry, just do it. Just feel free to do it. Break free from the shackles and embrace the art form. Just be concerned about the impact. All this is from Mr. Manners this morning. Be concerned about the impact that your words have on others. 
and he did a poem entitled, I Think, where he talked about a young prisoner, and he put himself in the place of the young prisoner with all that time in prison to think about all that he had done, to think he had committed a murder. So all those things for me are, are things that under UNESCO we want to embrace, we want to celebrate. I love to give people the opportunity because UNESCO is not just a secretariat. So when we can bring other people out to celebrate these days, this is what it's all about. UNESCO is all of us. And as one of the activities for World Poetry Day, this is something I, I love coming to, and I want to applaud. Did she, she disappeared? Oh, she's at the back. I want to applaud the efforts of Mrs. Daniel. You can take a bow, Mrs. Daniel. You do such a wonderful job, you and your staff, in organizing this event, and you have kept it up over the years. Even if she can't do it on the very day of commemoration, she does it as soon as she can to make sure that it, it, it stays with us and we have it going. So I, I want to, from the Office of the UNESCO, the Secretary, I want to encourage all of you, just keep writing. Whatever you write, and you can share it with someone, you can inspire somebody, and you can be poetic, or it can be just be free verse or whatever. Just keep writing and be a poet, even in prose. Happy World Poetry Day. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not good with this mic. <laughs> I love what Miss Warner had to say, that the poets had to say. It was a little bring come, carry come. But the message was received. You know, and the message was to speak, take up space with your voice. And as a budding speaker, one of the things I, I find very interesting from a Creole speaking society, a society with a dialect, and so as a society from a dialect, I have an idiolect because it's my language. And I know Miss Warner, fortunately or unfortunately for her, coming from the English classroom, would now have to contend with things like first language and language rights and you know, protection of language and the importance of the Creole or the dialect to transmit the culture and as an element of culture in itself. And I find a very interesting thing about us. We not like hear how we does talk. It not proper. And so they just tell me, when you're going on the stage, you have to speak proper English because people are looking up to you. And I find it so interesting that I'm not allowed to bring my language on big stage. It's for Niagara business. The audacity, yeah? And they just call me phone, you know? They just dial the number and call me to tell me when I should use my language and how my language to use. Imagine that. I can't talk the things how I want to talk the things. They want to bring things for me to talk. You ever hear the bring come carry come? In Jesus' name. We'll now have Mr. Mandy Byron blessing us with a musical piece. before I do that, a musical piece. Um, something I wrote a while back, very short, which I feel it kind of connects with what I'm about to do. It's titled Drum Roll. Drum Roll, please. Let's give it up for the one and only. The crowd erupts, the spotlight hits, and I freeze. Too scared to move, all eyes still. Silence becomes me an 
As my heart beats, deafens the room, I can't breathe. It's time to move. It's now or never make your move. Too nervous to move with beads of sweat washing down my face, screaming, play something. My mind goes blank, like a paper without ink, yet my hands steered, started moving as I possess my mind of its own. I stare at my hands, the windows of my eye, in desire, amazement. The sound of music fills the room, overtakes the deafening sound of my thumping heartbeat, keeping time to the rhythm of the beat. Nerves calm, and a sense of relaxation floods my body as the chord continues to groove to the melodious sounds I play. Now comfortable with where I am, I regain control as I start to groove, closing my eyes, allowing the music to fill my soul.
I don't even know what to say. Mm. Imela. That's Imela? Normally have a lot of chats, but that one just needed to, you know? I'm doing this social experiment where I'm trying to bring to bear the teacher as an edupreneur. How do we monetize the basic classroom skill? Because that is what he teach. That's a national product, a tourism product, a cultural product. And most often what we say to the teacher, and only the teacher, do me a favor, please. We don't go to the doctor about to do surgery and say, do me a favor, please. We don't go to the lawyer when we want to go high court or deal with somebody for your name. Do me a favor, please. But we just go to the teacher. And the artist, pension said the artist too. And say, do me a favor, please. But if we are going to compete and be relevant in this modern world, we need to know how to process products. And products are also intangible. That is what the creative economy is. How do we economize culture? How do we economize education? Because one of the reasons why, in Jesus' name, is because we are not viewed as income-generating sectors. How do we change that? We have a responsibility to change that. And we change that when we say hallelujah to good things, the good thing that we just witnessed, because it was incredible. It was incredible. He's an ambassador to the highest level, and at a young age, he has had opportunities to represent this great federation in Korea, in Asia, in Trinidad. Imagine he gone Trinidad, go play pan for panorama from St. Kitts. All of that is a hallelujah. Amen. We'll now have Miss Basil. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me. My name is Yakima Coffee Basil, and I am Dominican. And so tonight, <laughs> and so tonight, um, if you'd permit me, I will say two very short pieces. The first piece is called I miss the days I never had. So thank you so much to that poet who started talking about, you know, the latrines, right? So we're reminiscing tonight. I miss the days I never had. I miss the days I never had. The days of stories old. The days of naked standpipe baths and children you could scold. I miss the days in parents' tales of carrying coconut on head and how hard grandpa worked on banana boxing days and grandma's homemade bread. I miss river baths on sunny days and cocoa tea when it's cold and Lamoe and Johnny Cakes to fortify the weary soul. I miss cold pot roasted breadfruit and holidays on daddy's farm and hurricanes and treasured loot and calling ladies ma'am. I miss things you couldn't buy in stores like dreams and nation pride. Days when morals and ethics exceeded laws. Days of chaste grooms and blushing brides. I miss heroic cricketers 
And when Calypso itself was king, days when music didn't require filters and singers could actually sing. I miss trips to town at Christmas and bamboo burst in fun and Creole food eaten all year round and dancing belly to the drums. I miss the smell of progress, the notion of upward mobility and the hum of independence and the warmth of our people's humility. I miss having leaders of vision and the freedom of an intellectual press and the power in an informed population and young people who knew how to dress. I miss the memories of yesteryear, its glories and its guts, its trials with its triumphs, its promises and plots. But the beauty of the present is that she's the hope of yesterday and she speaks with a seductive accent that new legends are on the way. Thank you. Thank you so very much. The second piece that I'll do tonight I want you to put your hands together for all the ladies in the house tonight. And I also want you to put your hands together for the supportive men in our audience tonight. So this, this poem is entitled, A Woman's Colors. Shade of green Apple mixed with lavender, soft, sweet, vines of womanhood meander up sun-kissed skin, a precious brown like amber, embracing each curve, each delectable contour. Stretch marks look good in every color, even on skin as pale as alabaster, waves of plum, peach, yellow, and azure dance like gypsies to calypso and soca. Some stretch marks burn red with the brightness of fire, others asleep with the serenity of aqua. Some stretch marks are loud like the siren of fuchsia. Some make you blush, baby pink or magenta. Stretch marks are Mother Nature's calendar reminding you that all your green days are over. Girlish ties must now be cut asunder and into the arms of maturity surrender. Hips expand to make you a mother. Bosoms enhance so supple and tender. Some stretch marks shine with such glory and splendor, battle scars of that final trimester. And as you age, stretch marks also grow bolder. Their hallowed lines seem to reach higher and higher. Crescent arches of fine mercury and silver, there to prove that with age you grow wiser. Tattoos drawn by the needle of nature. Lifelong friend stretch marks last through forever like Caribbean sunsets. Cyan skies blaze with copper, creation armed with the joy of Crayola. Yet it seems the corporate world and the media have allied against the very blueprint of nature, trying to sell us healing oils and cocoa butter to save us from all those beautiful colors. Stretch marks gone is their song, is their mantra, but stand proud every woman Every mother, weigh your scars with grace, dignity, and honor, and shun the world with its self-hate agenda. Educate every son, every daughter. Let them know that you fought in a real war. The battlefield was the passion of labor. And to give life, a woman has to be colored. Thank you.
I'm going to just say amen. Amen. I, I feel colored to Miss Warner, tattooed by nature, she said. Woo. Yes, mommy. Could we put the cell phones on mute? It's okay. That was amazing. Woo. Now we're going to have Mr. Jordan Linton. <laughs> Blessed good evening to all. Um, I was originally supposed to do three pieces, one, of, one for myself, one for someone who couldn't make it, and one with my partner. But on our way here, we received news that her grandmother passed. So I won't be doing that piece. And I'm, I, changed, I am changing the piece that I was originally going to do for myself. So this is my piece. I wrote this piece at the end of 2022, closing the whole year. Silently. Silently, another year has run its course. Many dropped out of the journey, but many more joined midway. Success and despair came in droves and left in pairs. It was a quiet yet eventful year. Cry not for who is leaving, but worry for who, it, for who is to come. And all wives saying that can fit no better a place than this. This year is now over and has nothing left to give. The new year is upon us, no clue the rhythm she sings. Despite the unknown ahead, hope is what the masses foresee. Amongst said masses I stand, trying to see where their sights gaze. But only shadows and unnamed shapes before me. Despite lowering perspectives to theirs, despite copying fervent stances, despite trying and trying, pessimism be the easier target. Yet realism, surprisingly, is all we know. The year changes, but that is all. The people remain the same. No magical growth at all. No fruit to bear as no seeds planted. No hope to share for those who only pray. From two to three digits go. Yet success's formula remains the same. As a young man with dreams, what one must do has not changed. And the piece for a friend who was not able to make it, his name is Kevon Brown. It is titled, Don't Let Me Disappear. Don't let me disappear. Don't watch me from over there. Fading further into my despair, my fear, all the things I consider hard to bear. Sadness, insecurity, grief forlorn, madness, indecision, regret and scorn. Loneliness, fantasies, comfort zones and lines drawn in invisible sand separating me from the world. Why? Because I am not long for the earth, this globe, your world because I sorry in spite of my nature not to belong despite how well I may thrive from estrangement I long for someone to reach out just to make sure I may fight back bite back even just to make myself obscure but don't let me disappear don't let me forget the feeling of love that exists out there. Love in all forms, especially self-care. Don't let me forget the wonders of nature, the silent breeze, the warmth of the sun that brings frigid men to their knees. Don't let me take for granted the sway of the ocean waves that lull men to sleep after a tiring day. 
The smell of the forest, concrete and steel. The feel of a good book's pages while lying on the beach, blessed by the musings of another's minds otherwise out of reach. Love me hard enough to always remind me of the wonders of this world. I know it is an arduous task, almost too much to ask. Definitely not for the faint of heart and the not so smart. So if you manage to breach my walls and secure a spot in my hallowed halls, I ask, beg, plead, and pray that you will never on any day, regardless of what I say, please don't let me disappear. Good poetry. Good poetry. poetry. I'm going to say a hallelujah. Whole evening, good poetry. Don't let him disappear. You hear that? The young man is asking us to not let him disappear. He'll be back next year. And that means when you see him in town, you have to say, how are you doing? You're good? How the poem coming? How is the partner? You get married yet? <laughs> That's why there's access, young people. When you get married, <laughs> Kalana is <it's> true. <laughs> we'll now have Miss Jazara Andrew, and following her, Miss Heather Archibald and Kishma Isaac. We'll allow those three to run consecutively. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Yo, okay. So, I knew I was doing this for a while, like a while. And, you know, procrastinators, I really, I've, I thought about writing a poem for this. And then today I realized, well, it's today, you don't have a poem. <laughs> so I spent all day trying to figure out which poem to do, and I couldn't choose. So these poems are going to make you all a little uncomfortable, and I'm sorry. They're going to make you all a little uncomfortable, and I'm sorry. Emotionally. OK. I hate this feeling, the elephant on my chest, I think he forgets, like it stepped, maybe died, maybe slept. I hate this feeling, this river at a dam, I don't think it gives a dam or it wouldn't have held this well, I'm just waiting, just wishing this were well, this feeling, I hate it. The twisting and turning in my no nerve, the nerve of my stomach, starting to be really hard to stomach this crap, crap. I'm doing everything I can, but this can of worms won't just get it over with and open up. Maybe I just hate myself. Maybe it's just my body re rejecting the person I'm becoming. I'm not her biggest fan either, but turning on her when shit hits the fan is crazy. You got the girl thinking she's crazy. You're just like everyone else she's ever met. Maybe she's like this beca because she hates the version of me she met when she took over. Maybe I need her, but she needs me, doesn't she? Funny thought, it looks like I am the feeling, man, maybe I just hate myself. Sorry, okay. <laughs> this one isn't as bad. Um, I was reading my Bible, you know, not many people that I don't, okay, sorry. I was reading my Bible and I was reading Luke 20, gosh, 28, 24, I'm not really sure, you know, the Passover, the crucifixion, that chapter. And uh, I planned three poems, but I only ever got to, to write one. 
Um, still working on the rest, but this is a kiss from Judas. Oh, shoot, sorry. Um, the other one was called This Stupid Feeling. Yeah, okay. They say it's harder to fall in love than it is to fall out of it. Maybe I just hadn't fallen far enough because all the love I thought I had to give to you seemed to just disappear without any trace. I love you. You say those words so deeply as it, it consumes you. You're everything. Is this how Judas felt? Knowing he'd been loved so dearly by the fa Father in heaven while knowing he had not enough in him to love him even half as much. I love you. I know it's a lie, but it's easier to say than I have fallen out of what I thought was love for you. Did you tell him, Judas? Or does blasphemy just roll so easily off of your tongue that it was simple? Did his heart break? Did you hear it, Judas? He'd foretold, like your kiss I'd offered, had foretold the heartbreak of another. I saw it, the break in her soul, the crack in her eyes. She'd felt it. Jesus. Jesus felt it. You dare betray the son of man with a kiss. And you betray the daughter of a man with a kiss with lies of emotions you are incapable of. Are you not just as bad you betrayed him for just a bit of coin? And you? You fooled her off all in the name of good fun. Okay. This is the last one, I see you. But um, this is, yeah, let's hope I can see. <laughs> Body movements I tried to use to say no that apparently mean yes. I sit next to you. Half of my mind already in tune with the I am a man FM that's playing in yours. I already know what you're going to do before the thought certifies itself. You didn't get that degree of where your hands belong at Stanford. Obviously wasn't gifted a master's because you still haven't learned the third time. I move your underworked, unused fingertips away from my core. You still haven't learned. I don't want this. From the way I keep trying to gift you something else to do with your hands, I know what you're going to do before you do so. I cross my legs the second we sit down for the second time. I already trapped myself in the corner of the last row in the cinema. Yeah, you didn't catch that curveball until my legs uncurved and tangled themselves. Only the ball of my refusal takes too long to curve the earth of a hitter in front of your common sense of a catcher notices just in time. To hit, sorry, to hit what I actually mean too far away for you to see the change of direction does not mean my change of mind. Body movements I tried to use to say no that apparently mean yes. After I uncrossed my legs, scared they're too high, scared he can see the hairs of my nerves I've learned to become so insecure of, I pulled my dress down trying to put the thought further out of his reach, yet your grip, it seems to have been so strong that you interpreted the action as a nurturing mother tucking in her child who has no intention of being put to rest. How relentless. Thought this one would have been clear. I moved your hand, you dragged up my legs right back down. I guess you thought it meant wait. Thought I was saying wait until the movie had started at least, so you try again. This time you expect it, so your hand isn't as easily moved. I am scared. I thought you were a friend. Didn't realize all your questions of whether or not I had a man were only to uphold some misguided sense of codes to someone you may not even know. I thought you were a friend to me, yet your gender has bound stronger ties around your personality than our friendship. I thought you were my friend. I move your hand away again, and you took it as an invitation to take mine and yours, not as comfort, nor just to stop it from pushing you away when you did it again, only that didn't stop me. Probably not why God gave us two hands, but you know, helpful. Yet still did, but that still didn't stop you. You said nachos disgust you, probably why I decided to ask for my neglected nachos sitting on the armrest of the chair away on your right, and finally you hear me. 
You see the uncomfort in my eyes, hear the uneasy in my voice. Finally, you hear me say no. I shouldn't have to weave my nose into my movement to try to make you comfortable, not when you refuse to see I am not. You hurt me. I thought you were my friend. Thank you. This is when I wanted you to talk so that I could catch myself after that. Um, it, actually, I was going to be the one to apologize for the poem that I will read at some point. But before I do that, I need to kind of recover. And I did plan to just let me, you know, this technology and me don't work too well. I got it, I got it. So I don't know if this is a good time or not to do this, but I did plan to do it. So forgive me if it doesn't quite work in the mood, but that was something, wasn't it? So I want to, I want us to taste this poem. Uh, this is a poem called Litany by George Campbell. And many, many years ago, like what? Like 50 years ago, Jesus. It's really nearly 50 years. Um, when I taught Dowerty, my first, first class at Keon High School, I was 18 years old. Oh, God, now you know my age. Now it can't be 50 because I'm 68 yet. But anyway, the maths a little off. And this was one of the poems that I, I used to teach. I don't know if I actually taught you this. but um, So what I want to do with it, it's Litany by George Campbell. And what I want to do is read it, and we're going to do it like a litany. When I read a line, you will read with me. Would you do that? So that we could all taste this poem. Okay? Thank you. Litany by George Campbell. I hold the splendid daylight in my hands. I hold the splendid daylight hands. in my hands. Hands. Inwardly grateful for a, lovely day. Be for a lovely day. Thank you, life. Thank you, life. Daylight, like fine, like a fine fan, spread from my hands. Daylight, like scarlet poinsettia. Daylight like yellow cashew flowers. Daylight like clean water. Daylight like green cacti. My favorite line. Daylight like sea sparkling with white horses. Daylight like sun strained blue sky. Daylight like tropic hills. Daylight like a sacrament in my hands. Amen. Do we feel better? I do. I love that poem, and I've taken it with me to New York. I teach New York children and big people that poem because I think it works everywhere, even if we don't have sun strained blue skies all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to read a poem that my spirit told me to read when I was leaving the house. And, you know, I've kind of been looking to see if I, I must really read that poem, but. It's Women's History Month, and, uh, you know, some of these not-so-happy poems need to be read and told, and I can't find the poems that maybe Tain the Spirit was telling in the first place. I don't know. What, what I, and I don't like to say, you know, the Spirit tell me things, because sometimes I don't know if it's me or the Spirit, or 
or what kind of spirit it is. So I don't know. I can't find a poem. It's funny. What is it called? I, I need to look in my thing. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Yeah, I need to go to the... And this is my book, eh? So it's terrible when you can't find something in your own book. Uh, what is it? I, and then, of course, I can't... What the name of the poem is? <laughs> questions, questions, questions there. 38. I had it together, but, you know, I got kind of discombobulated there. Yeah, okay. So here it is. Questions. <clears throat> and I have to say, I'm not going to say too much because I, I feel like we should read the poem rather than tell about the poem and then read the poem. But this poem, this is something that I witnessed as a child, right? And uh, it has always been with me, and I always feel like I have this need, like the ancient mariner, to just tell anybody who comes about this, this particular scene. So I was happy when I got it into a poem. Questions. Why does the woman, what does the woman think about when he pummels her? Does she think that perhaps the women there may be laughing at her? but not to worry because their turn will come? Or does she worry that water from the open drain is washing her face, seeping into her mouth, open to scream out loudly so he is certain that she hurts? Does she wonder how the peas got burnt or perhaps what possessed her to spent so long with Aunt Jane's fence that she ran late with dinner or the rice was still, so the rice was still wet and the stew runny on the stove. What goes through her head as the thick cane stalk shreds, leaving its syrup on arms and exposed thighs? Does she think as she sprawls upon the street, I'll do better tomorrow? Does she wonder why the men move to stop him only when the first stalk fails and he reaches for another? Does she consider grinding glass for his food? Or surely, this time, she will never return. Yeah, so that needs to be said, I think. I'm going to leave it there. Good evening, everyone. I just want to thank the stakeholders and organizers for inviting me to this auspicious fifth annual poetry circle. Already, I am enjoying all of the creative energy and the artistic expressions that are flowing and glowing. Excellent presentations, everyone. I will be sharing a poem from my book entitled Screaming for Your Touch. This book is organized in around three themes, being in touch with yourself, touching the world, and touched by a higher power. The poem is extracted from the theme, touching the world. This poem is entitled The Way of Love. It's quite fair, it isn't. Fair. It's a twofold poem. I love love and I love to love. Do you love love? Love can sometimes bombard us with its frustrations and agonies, but of course, it shows us how we experience pleasures and joy as well. The way of love. It isn't fair. It isn't fair to love someone who loves us not at all. Nor is it fair to die for one who cares 
not if we fall. Oh no, of course, it isn't fair for you to crave so much and cherish greatly so very dear one whose love you haven't got. Could it be fair to keep alive a love of no return? It isn't fair to make it thrive and let yourself be burned. Unfair it is to hurt yourself and heed not to let go. Unfair to love somebody else whose love for you can't grow. It's quite fair. It's quite fair for you to love that one who delights your care. It's quite fair to express your love than succumb to hidden fear. It's quite fair when you do know your love holds firm and true. Then it is so fair for you to show it's right in all you think and do. It's just as fair for you to say, you are my loving dove. I'll care for you in a special way because you are my love. Yes, it is fair for me to be beside you every day, to act and hear and let you see my love is here to stay. Thank you. So we had some very powerful pieces. First, we had the bad friend who don't know how to stop touch <laughs> and who don't know how to take no. So you have to bless God for two hands because when you're using one, you know, you come back with the next one and you're going to say, don't touch me. And there is something quite amazing she said in her piece as we were listening. She thought he was her friend, but he had, he had not, not just alternatives and motives, he had this sort of, not persistence, she said he had this thing to his masculinity. He had this ode to his masculinity that was greater than to her friendship. Like, because he's a boy, he's supposed to touch her. He's entitled. It's a long struggle. So he has this promise to his masculinity that empowers him to touch girls because he's a boy. And that's what boys just do if you ain't a punk. I mean, how are you going to explain it? Fix and chill if you're going to chill in it. And, and that culture seems very interesting. Right, Mr. James? And then Heather, the pummeling of men, women by men, you know, at first I was like, okay, sound interesting, pummeling. And then it got more interesting. I was like, oh, she, get, she getting a bang up? In the drain. And it's such an ordinary part of our Caribbean culture. And what's even... Yeah, and she, she sound like she get bang up cause the pot bun. Imagine that, how you gonna hit somebody daughter cause the pot bun? Send him to me. <laughs> and then we had another beautiful piece by a young published author and a poet about unrequited love, good love, bad love, self love, all kind of love she was talking about in Jesus' name. And, and that permission to love love and tell him you love him even if you're unsure he gonna love you back made that brave <laughs> made that brave now we're going to have miss jerry webb hansel manners and dabrio miss webb's not here so, 
Okay, Dabrio is not here. So we're going to have Webb, Manners, and Condell. Good evening, all. Um, isn't it remarkable that when you are looking at a crowd and yourself is not really in the crowd, that only one person catches your attention? It's quite remarkable. And I wrote a poem based on that scenario. Now, the word it is repeated over and over again. And I would like you to try to work out to what the it refers. It's entitled, Hold On To It. Hold on to it for as long as you can. Hold on to it for as long as you can, for a time will come when you'll be plagued by man. That time will be when you are jealous, which makes you sad, or he is jealous, which makes him mad. That time will be when your child is sick and no medicine is found to do the trick. That time will be when you've no money and there's no one around to call you honey. That time will be when you've no food, causing you to cost, like, cost life for being no good. That time will be when you live under stress and you let yourself go into a big, big mess. That time will be when you become unattractive because your family's care made you hyperactive. That time will be when you've gone all flabby flat and looked just like the neighbor's old alley cat. <laughs> so hold on to it for as long as you can. That day when there never was a man. When proudly you walked among the crowd, not dressed too loud in a costume very much darker than a cloud. In rough denim wear, you were bedecked in pants, like a panty right up to your neck. <laughs> Shod in mannish calfskin leather boots. When in cahoots with your liming friends, you were carefree and full of ease and a big, big tease. So hold on to it for as long as you can For the day will come when you look back and remember that you were happy and used to be as cool as a cucumber. That day before your sagging breasts drag you down to the ground and all that is left is a dirty big mound. So hold on to it for as long as you can. What is the it? are we talking about? No, 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 no. <laughs> who, who, who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? We are talking about a young girl. A young girl from the time she was happy. No man, no man. Until she started to get children. Worried about child. Sagging breasts. Until she died. Only the mound is there. Hold on to it, young girls, for as long as you can. He sound like Mr. Tatum. Anybody that's read Mr. Tatum poem on Facebook? He always talking about the 45 year old women, them in the church, and when they just go to church for the reckoning. I feel the it is your goodie. 
You're good, good. That's what it is. The goodness about you. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. So it, whatever the it is, I suspect is the goodness, the goody, the good, good, all of that good. Hold on to it because he said, right? A time gonna come when your breast gonna be sagging on the ground, and all you're gonna have is a big mouth. Hold on to it, cause a time gonna come when you train, it's gonna be sick, and you ain't gonna get it, and the medicine gonna come by it. And it just talks about all of these things that come when you give yourself to the family and the care and the community. So there is. And, and you know you know what is interesting about this? His fathers and uncles like him that just tell us, you know, well, you don't plan to get married. <laughs> they see you in the church, good, good with it, you know. And then they're telling you it is appropriate to give it up. And they're going to tell you, hold on to it. You can't win for them, you know. You cannot win for them. In the name of Jesus. So we're going to have... Manners, Mr. Manners. Good evening. The poem I'm going to read is one of the poems in my recently published book, Beyond the Bush and More. It was published in 2021. And the second section of it deals with poetry. The po it's all about Nevis. Life in Nevis, when I was a little boy, six, 40s, 60s, 50s, 60s. The second section is about poetry. And the poem I'm going to read this evening is entitled, well, I shouldn't say that yet. This poem has a touch of sadness, but it also has a touch of joy and admiration. The name of it is In Praise of Cecil Webb. And you'll understand why joy is mixed with sadness. And when I heard the theme for this poem, every, write poetry even in prose, this poem came to mind. Because this was a young man living in the gingerland in Nevis, who by traditional norms was not supposed to be a poet. He didn't have higher education. He didn't have O levels, I don't think. But still, he wanted to be a poet, and he demonstrated it by writing poetry. He published them in the newspaper in Nevis, and so he just pushed on. And then something happened. One day he fell from a mango tree and died. He died. And I was so moved by his example that I volunteered to write a poem for his, at his funeral. So the poem I'm going to read was done for his funeral and at his funeral. And in a way, it's a celebration of exactly what the theme speaks about, admiring those who were not supposed to be poets or who some people might feel could not be poets. So it's, it fits in with the day, celebration of those, even in prose. In praise of Cecil Webb, let me read the whole thing. Compose for and recited at his funeral. He died at a young age after falling from a mango tree. He was not a man of letters, nor schooled to high degree, not trained in word or thought, in law or history, never had the luxury of a loft, lofty home with gilded walls and fancy trim. He didn't drive a car with shiny wheels or booming sound. He was just a humble man, a humble working man, simply traveling on. Yet within his bosom was a strong and fertile mind, fighting for expression, bursting with passion, straining to break free, to say things he had to say, stories he had to tell. And so, defying the logic of the day, the logic that he wasn't supposed to be a poet. He ventured forth with bold endeavor to have his show. Who wouldn't remember him with smiling face and youthful glow as he urged the youth to concentrate 
So their school work would be great. That's a line from one of his poems he published in the papers. As he urged the youth to concentrate, so their school work would be great. Or reminding us of God's plan to shape us in the potter's hand. No, he was not a man of letters, nor school to high degree. But neither were many we now revere and cite as heroes. Our annals tell of many who started simply, then grew and grew to change the world. And so the simple posture of a man is no index of what he could become when molded by the master's hand. And we are left to ponder on what might have been our work he left undone. Was this a master poet bursting forth? Who knows what words he might have penned? what books he might have written, what mountains he might have climbed if life had not been snatched away by his untimely fall. We'll miss you, Cecil. We'll miss you all. Your smiling face and impish grin, your passion, and this line made me crack up during the funeral, your passion for attaining heights that others thought beyond you. We salute you as a symbol of what a man could strive to be despite the odds. We never cannot understand God's master plan and why he took you home. Maybe he needs a poet around his royal throne. Maybe he picked you for the job to be his very own. No, he was not a man of letters, nor school to high degree. But oh, what an inspiration. We'll read your poems now you're gone and let them serve to tell that when mind triumphs over matter, all will be well. Goodbye, Cecil. You maybe, you maybe never knew, but you have left a mark on all our hearts forever. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Thank you. What you're saying, Mr. Panchal? What's the feeling? It's touching. Admiration. Passion. Pain. I like when he said, um, maybe God wanted a poet around his throne. Yeah, I like that too. I'm like, maybe I'm going to heaven to teach. In case they don't want to let me in, you know, there's always a teacher shortage. Like, I can go to heaven to teach. I'm going to up there for that job. <laughs> That's brilliant. Extremely brilliant. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to have and in this order, before I take the mic again, forgive the slouch, I'm trying to accommodate the mic. Hold it like this. Okay, this is not my skill. We're going to have, oh, this so nice. Carla Astafan, Les Roy Williams, Shania Taylor, Candice Prentice, are those persons in the house? Candice is like me, I go in lot after these people I go in. I know the feeling. So let's welcome poet extraordinaire, Miss Carla Astafan. Come on. Good evening, ladies and gents. How is everyone doing this afternoon, this evening? Okay, I've been at a, I was at a workshop all day 
And um, I wasn't sure if I was going to come, but then I called Heather and said, let's go. Um, she was going, are you going? And she said, yes. Yeah. So I said, come pick me up because I don't feel like driving. But I wasn't sure I was going to be on the program. I know I told, I said, yeah, I, 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 I know normally you send up a, an email and keep reminding me, but anyway, I'm always prepared. Thank God for the phone. There's always stuff in the phone. And I love how this, my spirit, I love the spirit. My spirit told me to do a poem that I wrote when I was going to CFBC. I returned to school here at CFBC in eight years ago. And so I did communication studies, um, communication, that's what it's called, right? Communication yeah. studies. And I had to do uh, the piece, it's, it's, what's it called? Expos huh? The expository piece. I was writing on crafts, the, the, about handmade crafts. You know, I'm a crafts person. And I had to do this piece. And this piece, I actually wrote observing a man who's now deceased. He was a teacher at the Kaon High. So this, this spirit was correct because I'm hearing a lot of pieces for persons who have passed. He passed last year. I didn't get to say this piece at his funeral, um, but I sent it to his daughter, uh, Sabrina Warner. So his name was uh, his Victor Warner, who passed last year. And uh, you know, I spend a lot of time going to the beach. So every morning I would go to the beach. Victor was at the beach, chipping away at rocks and creating pieces out of the rocks. So I was inspired by that, so I decided to write this piece for my expository piece, and so this is what I will share today. Artisan by the Sea. The rock called to him, he said, as if the rock could talk. It pulled him like a magnet. Every day he came, he sat there, alone on the beach, looking at the rock wishing he could take it home. Then one day he drew a face. It was the face of a Rasta man. Long locks cascading to the ground like it belonged there. A spirit emerges as if seeking freedom from the belly of the rock. He returned another day. The rock is speaking to him is speaking loudly in his dream. He returns to the rock where alone in silence, the sound of the sea as waves crash on the seashore, his only company, shh, shh. He meditates deeply as he draws another face on another side of the rock, the eyes, nose, and mouth, like an African tribal mask, another spirit is freed from the rock. He feels euphoric as he draws a third and final face, another raster. The artist, still not satisfied, beckoned by the rock, he becomes addicted to its charm. He comes every day now, armed with chisel and hammer. He sits there on the lonely beach, chipping away at the rock, calm, focused, working with a cool meditation, every chip in harmony with the waves. As he chisels away the lines he drew, carving out sculpted faces in the rock. It has become his life's work. He feels a sense of satisfaction as he nears completion, but wishes he could take it to his studio home. He knows there will be no financial reward for his work. No, no great accolades will be bestowed. Just the admiration and wonder of beach goers who for generations may stop, look, and wonder just how this treasure came to be created. 
They will wonder who is VW etched for eternity in this rock of faces. Today, as we go to the beach along, as I go to the beach along with my children, I pause to admire it. My daughter asked, who do that? I told her an artist created this one of a kind piece. And guess what? He can't move it from the beach. So it's here. Just admire it. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> it has been a, a long day and we want to get out of here. <laughs> yes. Huh? Okay, you're good, okay. <clears throat> I am going to do a piece that I call I Understand. I understand, and understand me, <laughs> yeah. I understand what it feels like to care for someone. When there is fire in my belly and I want to give everything. I understand how my stomach aches when I can't express what I want, I understand. I understand how much it hurts when I give my heart and it's ripped to pieces. When I would prefer to be dead rather than face the pain of rejection, I understand what it's like to feel lonely and depressed. I understand. I understand what it's like to be appreciated for who I am when I could take off my mask in front of you and feel safe. I understand that life is about taking risks. I understand. I understand what it's like to be alone with myself, to face my own thoughts, darkness, and light. I understand how difficult it is to accept myself. I understand. I understand that God loves me no matter what, when I am weak, tormented, and insecure. I understand that I too must love others as they are. I understand, and I hope you understand too. Thank you. Good night, everyone. My poem is entitled, The Shadow of a Man. Why do we think that the rattling of a key is a man, and the leader of a country is not a woman, and the officials in high positions are not worthy to be persons that give birth, raise generations, and build up households? Are we not worthy to lead a country are we not worthy to control his finance? Are we not worthy to lead his tourism, advance his academic infrastructure? Are we not worthy? The question is, are they worthy? They abuse their position, treat us as sexual objects, abandon us like we are their footstools. Leave us to raise their children, who turn around and become leaders because we are able to do it on our own. Not that we want to, but because we are forced to. But once our minds and souls are in agreement, 
we take care of our sons, love them, nurture them, because they are our first fruits. Mister, sir, gentlemen, behind every powerful man is a powerful mother who fought to bring him out of the fiery furnace to the cool of his cube. Good night. Good night. My poem is not titled, sorry. <laughs> I ran to the cliffs away from your side, for it was the only place, the only place that I could hide. I hope you understand what I try to tell you. I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what to do. Am I the enemy? Why am I here? What is the cause of the hurt in me? But I promised I would no longer go there. This wasn't a give or take usual situation. Our problems were wrapped in red tape, leaving us with no strength left to go on. No one knows why we don't even remember when. No more tears left to cry, not even a solution to possibly mend. Are you looking? Am I there? Can't you feel me pulling? I am trying to return from God knows where. Is that your hand? I want to believe it to be true. Please bring me back to land. Please bring me back to you. I especially like her outfit. I like it because it's disruptive and confrontational and she looked good in it and you have to watch her. She knows she look good in it. That's why she wear it. That's why we just wear things, you know, because we know we look good. But when Miss Warner was talking, she spoke about the poets who are selected. And everybody said, be brave. Don't be afraid. And then we just choose who to give permission to show up and how to show up and tell them when and why and how and what the rule be. But then tell them, don't be afraid. This post-colonial, neo-modern society is very confusing, you know? Very, very confusing, but I like it. I like it. And I like that we are bringing back I'm not sure if we could bring back spirits. I, I, I don't play with them kind of things and so. But I like how we bring back, we remember. We remember people and their contribution and their names. And I'm very much a fan of calling people name and remembering. Remembering them because it's who we are. It's the contribution and connection and the continuation when you understand Les Roy say, with he confusion self? <laughs> yes, with he confusion self, but we won't go home and he gone back and sit down. He talks about love so vulnerably and boldly. Y'all realize he put the kind of baritone in his voice to talk about love like we and read through the sound. That is what poetry is. It's a space that is safe, and maybe it's a safe itself to take us places where we could taste. And it's okay for everybody to take space in the place and be safe. It is okay for everybody to take space in the place and be safe. You see how we're playing with the words? And using the languages? The languages. Because until all of us feel, I think Bob Malady says something like that, you know. Something about everybody feeling equal. None of, well, until every man something, may not Bob Malady fan, but yeah. 
Something like that. Lie down, TV now. I'm going to learn this thing for Bob Marley, okay? I'm going to learn it. Haile Selassie. See, Haile Selassie, what you want to tell us? Until every man. Until the philosophy. Come on, come on. This is choral speaking, community learning. Teach the young yellow thing. Rasta man behind you, Mr. Almany. Go ahead. Unt it, it goes something until nobody is it. Everywhere is war. That's why the confrontation must happen. Because we have locks and keys and gatekeepers. And we send some away and some came and take their places. With brown and not so brown faces. Imagine that, huh? We send them away and some came and take their places and say, I must ask them for permission to be me on my stage with my language. <laughs> wow, that's what they're looking for? So now we're going to have Mr. Armony. Tonight is the first night I met him, but I know his name so well. I told him he's famous. very much, Madam Chair. Just for the record, that song by Bob Marley was based on a speech by Emperor Haile Selassie to the League of Nations in 1953. So Bob Marley basically used his, his speech and created a song out of it. And so it, it, there's a historic connection. I came prepared to do two items, but I will do just one because I sense that there are lots of things, lots of, uh, you know, lots of other items to be, to be heard and said. And you know, we're getting a little restless, some of us, so I'll just do one. Um, and just to give it a little context, my, my, mother, my mother's parents um, had two, 10 children, and uh, most of them settled eventually in Canada, the US, the UK. And some years ago, um, some cousins initiated contact with all family members. So I, there are lots of cousins and other people I don't really know. And out of this came a newsletter. And so every month, a list of birthdays are presented by email to everybody. And uh, not only birthdays, but other anniversaries as well. So two years ago, I was invited to do a piece um, for the month of September based upon the independence anniversary of St. Kitts Nevis. So I wrote a poem. And um, later on, I submitted this poem to local print media, but I couldn't afford the cost of publishing it. And I'm not on social media, so this is the first time that I will have the opportunity of sharing this poem with, um, with others. So I welcome, Sunita, I welcome the opportunity to make this presentation. It's called some thoughts on independence. It brings no comfort at all to me to be part of a mother colony. Forerunners of terrible native genocides, destroyer of innumerable African lives. Emancipation commemoration has come and went. How much do we remember such an event? Now, independence anniversary celebrations showcase our national accomplishments and acclaim the glory of politicians of the past and the present. Yet, it brings great joy and pride to me to pace the strides of our short journey, to appreciate our healthy democracy, 
to contemplate the beauty of my country. The grace, goodwill, and dignity that I see of people in the street, in the grocery. The intelligence and energy that I feel among youths after school and on the playing field. The innovative, enterprising job creation among many young people of this federation. Wonderful for a people out of slavery. Would that they learn more of our history and discern our core Caribbean identity. There are so many things that I really like, but wish silencers are put on the motorbikes and on the music that intrudes near and far from the interiors of some motor cars. For those on the route to explore their roots and try to open the door to local memories and truths, I celebrate as you liberate and attune your mind and relegate colonial attitudes far behind. Sila. Thank you, Mr. Almany. Larry. Thank you, Mr. Larry Almany. <laughs> but you see why it's so important for us to share space? I had an idea of a thing I wanted to say, not really knowing the thing, and we was helping to say the thing and you know everybody fighting to find the thing because I kind of could have identified the thing <laughs> and then the elder behind there said the thing when he realized we didn't know the thing and that is why we should share space and after he said Miss Wyatt next to him that come generation send me Miss Charles this is the song and this is the quote because technology is important in the learning space. So she makes sure she set me up. Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. Everywhere is war. I can't sing. But, and we need to remember that all of us should find space in the same place and feel safe. Now we're going to have the great, the indomitable, the phenomenal, my literature teacher, Mr. O'Loughlin Tatum. But I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna teach Michelina that my name does not have an O. <laughs> All right. The poem I'm going to read this evening is called "The Battle of the Senses." It made me pause. It caused me to stop and muse when I heard it from the lips of an annoyed street vendor, standing over tray, sharpened knife poised, ready to sever a handful of green bananas to satisfy the demands of an impatient customer for two dollars worth. Then I heard it again from a woman hustling home to her children after a long hard day at an industrial site factory. That was when it dawned on me that we actually live in two different worlds. One is the world of book sense, and the other is the world of common sense. And the people in the world of common sense absolutely and totally believe that the people in the world of book sense are really dumb. <laughs> and so, the people in the world of common sense are not 
prepared to tolerate the slightest misunderstanding from the people in the world of book sense. The people in the world of common sense believe that the people in the world of book sense are supposed to understand everything from right from the beginning. Otherwise, the people in the world of common sense will not hesitate to let the people in the world of book sense know that the reason they do not understand is because the people in the world of book sense have no common sense at all. And the people from the world of common sense are often quite prepared to announce to the entire world that common sense is better than book sense. Yes. And it dawned on me that both worlds are entangled in a secret, undeclared war. And I'll tell you a little secret. The people in the world of book sense are awfully afraid of the people in the world of common sense. Because the people in the world of common sense sometimes have no scruples of neither when nor where to prove to every passerby that the people in the world of book sense are people with no common sense at all. And so, washrooms and bathrooms have become regular hiding places for people who live in the world and work in the world of book sense. When from their desk, they see the unannounced arrival of one of the outspoken representatives from the world of common sense, who just cannot understand why he has to wait when he comes to do business with the people in the world of book sense. And as I watch this battle between the people in the world of book sense and the people in the world of common sense, it dawned on me, yes, it dawned on me, that anyone with any kind of sense can see that all this talk about book sense and common sense is nonsense. Thank you. From the common sense world, that does win, you know? That does win. Them days who priests don't sing no thank you for. They declare war right there. Anyhow, anytime, any place. Yeah. <laughs> but it make no sense. Well done. <laughs> I'm going to use that analogy and get the book so I don't steal it. I'd reference it. Miss, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Edwards, Alistair Edwards, yes. your turn to the podium, sir. Yes. Are you from common sense or book sense? <laughs> A little bit of both? Okay. Good evening, good evening, all. I'm sure a lot of persons wouldn't associate me with poetry coming from the world of agriculture and sports, football specifically. However, a number of stars, yes, you know more. <laughs> a number of stars aligned and it, they have gotten me thus far. I must say a public thank you to Michael Blake who challenged me in a conversation we had at, at the beach. And then I met the mighty encourager who encouraged me to get, to get thus far. I need to say a little bit more so I could work off your nervousness because when I came into this room and see names like Lockling Tatum, Curtin Pension, what is my name doing there? But I was comforted by Mr. Morton's poem, thank you very much, and the summary by Miss Doherty. Doherty, good which more or less told me, do not be bounded. Write what you feel. And this poem, I really felt it. It's something that happened. 
It's entitled Colonization. And no, Mr. Pension, it's not uh, Mr. Tatum. It is not pronounced incorrectly. It's colonization. <laughs> Strolling along the beach on a regular sunny afternoon, when suddenly there was a sound, the sound of colonization. Let's assess this situation. My home, 15 minutes away. Colonization, five minutes away. Timothy Beach Resort is closed for the day. Fortunately, there's a bucket within my reach. Got to find that abandoned beach. I got to find that abandoned beach. <laughs> Reassessment. Abandoned beach, can I get there in just a few? Colonization, no, three minutes due. Or less, I fear. I got to get there. I got to get there. I got it there. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Finally, nobody is watching. No one is around. So it's streaking, then washing, then streaking. It's over. Whew. Now, where was I before this almost doom and gloom? Oh, yes. Strolling along the beach on a regular sunny afternoon. That was brilliant, wasn't it? The brevity, the cliffhanger, colonization. Yes, that was, that was, I think all of us could, you know, understand a little colonization. That was brilliant. That was Brilliant, okay? Brilliant. The brevity, the nostalgia, the familiarity, the laughter you were able to invoke. Magnificent. Mr. Paris? Linnell Bingyai Paris. Um, good night. No, it's, okay, it's, okay, it's, okay, it's okay, it's okay. This drum is loud. Um, in the vein of Black History Month, we just come out of Black History Month. I'm a teacher also. <laughs> I do the African drumming in schools. We just come out of Black History Month. Um, I'm going to do this simple song, O oh Freedom. Hope you enjoy. And go home to the Lord and be free. Oh, freedom. And go home to 
Africa, where I am so free. Did everybody just see the teacher in Miss Warner? Did you all just see the teacher in her? <laughs> she was like, shh, shh, come, come, come. <laughs> okay, no, that was brilliant, wasn't it? Let's give him another round of applause. He came all the way from Nevis. <laughs> Miss Dabrio. Did I say it correct? Oh, she's not here. Miss Unoma. 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 Good evening, everybody. <laughs> languages. 250 languages in my country. And many dialects. So I'm going to greet you. I'm going to tell you my name is Afam Unoma. My name is Unoma. My name is Unoma. Ich heiße Unoma. That's my mother's language. She was German. I never knew her. But it's, I, I find that really important that you were talking about how we have to have the right to express ourselves in our own languages. I for follow up when I talk for pigeons this night when I for no understand me. So you can go to BBC Pigeon. I'm going to read it or listen to it. But I would love to see BBC Patois or Creole one of these days. Anyway, I wish I had heard Mr. Par uh, Mr. Manners' speech this morning because then I would have given you the poem I, I originally wanted to um, not recite but show. It's a poem that's written in um, corporate, corporate logos. But... I lost my bottle because right in the middle of it, it's a love poem, and it, in the middle of it, it had, had a little bit of adult content, and I thought, no, you, you can't. You're singing the Lord's song in a strange land, just yeah, fall in line. So it's, uh, it's still Women's Month, and every woman is a daughter. And I was actually brought here by my dear colleague, Shanae, who is uh, younger than my youngest daughter. Thank you very much for bringing me here, Shanae. So while I wrote this for, I have a da two daughters and a granddaughter, actually. While I wrote this for my daughter, either one of them, I read it today for Shanae, who's like a daughter to me. She's also, like I said, my colleague. It's called To My Daughter. Caught in a loop of female humanness, I looked upon her tininess my newborn daughter in my arms surpassed all worldly manly charms. Through ovaries we came to be, she, me, 
together, we had occupied a room. Let's occupy our wounds. A value chain of umbilical cords, not just actions, not mere words. I mother my daughter as she will mother hers, and simultaneously she'll mother me back in reverse. Thank you. Thank you. I made notes. So oh, here we go. Uma. Unoma. So the next time we see Unoma, we're going to tell her her name is Unoma. Because we know Unoma. And we're going to tell her that is not your name, Unoma. It's Unoma. There's no Y in her name. Okay. You see why we need to share this space? Yes, we just get message to carry. You really want to meet her? Yeah. Unoma. Unoma. Fix it, Jesus. What I liked about her presentation is the essence of what they taught me in language school. And I went to you, and I did, you know? a kind of language study there, and so I feel I could talk anyhow because I have a UE certificate, and it mean a kind of bright. Not all the way bright, but a kind of bright. Right, let's try, let's try. Watch it like me, sure, Michelle Lina Baga, the degree and I pay for it. Amen. Book sense and common sense, right? <laughs> Anybody notice that she's a Niger girl? You notice? She went into a kind of pigeon they wait in I do. Hey, wahala day. Hey. Wow. Miss Wyatt laughing after me. She didn't know I so much canker lately. She in trouble me tomorrow, you know. Miss Daniel tell Miss Wyatt not to trouble me, okay? All right. Now we're going to have Miss. Taylor, then Miss Andrew, Chizara, you said all of them. She's the only CFB student, so she could have as much space as she desires. And then James Galloway. James is not here. Okay, so we'll have Miss Taylor and then Miss Andrew. Um, good night, everyone. Um, this poem is entitled Our Deepest Fear by Marian Williamson. And before I commence this poem, I just wanted to indicate that this poem is dedicated to anyone who's been suffering or struggling with low self-esteem and low self-confidence. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that most frightens us. And we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? But actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine, as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it is not just in some of us. It is in all of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others the permission to do the same. And as we're liberated from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I was just told we have some twins in the house. Say hi for us. Yeah, they're twins. Really twins, Carla, really? Yes. They bring good luck? Yes, in the Yoruba culture. You Yoruba girl or? Ibo, eh, Chinua Achebe? Eh, Chinua? Chi, is godlike, oh. And that one is a It happens when they're twins. You get it confused. It's okay. And they're beautiful twins. So it must be hard. Now we're going to have Jazara. Where did she go? There she go. Hi again. I swear this time won't be as bad as last. If y'all notice, I have three books up here. Kind of lost poems, my bad. Okay. So, gonna do more than one again. Sorry, I'm not taking up a lot of y'all time. Apologies. Heavy is the head. They say, heavy is the head that wears the crown, but a crown can be so easily removed. I say, heavy is the head of a creative mind, the ones weighed down by never-ending pain. Tell me, how can I remove this burden that sits on my shoulders as if I were Atlas and it were the world? Tell me, is this to be my punishment, my boulder to push up the hill? Is this my inescapable punishment, nemesis? Heavy is the head. Heavy is the head that makes the crown, the one behind the mask, the mask of another whose smile shines bright and tears are few. Heavy is the, is the head of an unborn dream. <clears throat> Typical love. He was half of a soul I thought was mine, I, an entire world I thought he'd created just for me, the king of a heart I thought was mine. He's someone else's, her soul and his fit together like two halves of the same whole. He was a world that he created especially for her. He was the king of her heart and she the queen of his. Was he ever really mine? Was that smile I'd fallen in love with even ever for me, the spark of hope in his eyes, was I ever the cause? I was the bane of his existence, never the object of his affection, though his desires were always close companions of mine, I was his all. Until I reduced myself to the nothingness of his past, made myself the fictitious of his future, he was a dream. But I was the monster hiding in the closet, the beast that lived under his bed. We were never supposed to coincide, never meant to coexist. I had alienated myself from the beautiful love he claimed to give. I was his never. Because I could no never show him, he'd be my always. What goes around? What goes around comes around. She walked around as if she'd never heard the phrase, as if no one had ever told her of karma. Nemesis, do you not see her sins? Ne oh, sorry. Yeah, nemesis, do you not see her sins? Do you not hear the cries of her victims? Nemesis, where is the retribution? The the reputation that had followed your name and put fear in the eyes of oppressors. Nemesis, do you not hear her voice? What goes around should come around. Like the day comes around every morning after the moon has said its farewell. Or like spring, after seemingly 
endless winter. What goes around should come around, if not only because it is the way of the world. Um, a little, I, said, I call Nemesis twice. If you don't know in Greek mythology, um, Nemesis is the Greek god of ret retribution. So, yeah, okay. This is the last one. This is the last one, I swear. Okay. If I could find it. Okay. Okay. A little backstory to this one. One day, me and my, um, one day I went to church, and normally I go to church with my mother, but she didn't go that day, so I had to come, my father had to drop me home. And uh, he has a bus, so he usually like, takes people, and we had to drive through town, and we were driving up Victoria Road, and we passed Warner Park, and I'd never before seen ac um, kids actually playing on Warner Park's field, because you know, it's usually locked, but I did that day. I never saw little boys playing, playing football on Warner Park's field. I never saw little boys playing football on Warner Park's field. Never where the adults worked. On open fields and empty streets, in backyards and little parks. But never here. Not until the Sunday afternoon, my dad's bus had gone to town, running around and having fun, reveling in the beauty of the amazing sport. I never saw little boys playing football on Warner Park's field. Until the Sunday afternoon, my father's bus went off course. It was the smallest boy's turn to play in goal. All his friends laughed and joked about how easily it would be to score on him. I never saw little boys playing football on Warner Park's field. Until the Sunday afternoon, I found myself in town. That fateful day where girls went on the side just looking on, but on the field where they truly belonged. Okay. Thank you. First, let me thank you. I want to thank you all very much for waiting, for staying. Do you hear me? Um, yes. And permit me to do a little piece. I was moved by the spirit of the piece that Carla did, and I want to do this for someone who I knew and is now deceased as well. He's, he was an artist. He's still an artist. He's somewhere around painting the, the pearly gates of heaven. And so I want to do this first before I do my main piece for, for this evening. Engrossed, the artist enters a world of his own and loses himself intimately in an orgy of colors. Haunted by his muse, he pours out his soul on a naked canvas, exposing a piece of himself to surgical scrutiny from the fertile fields of fantasy and wild imaginings, straddling somewhere between reality and the surreal, a character wonderfully weird and sweetly eccentric. Painting fingers caress his brush with Picasso's precision. And like a wellspring, the creativity oozes out of his soul as he massages oil on the blank skin of the canvas. And with soft, well-measured, delicate brush strokes, strokes in time turn to form and form into figure. Then right before your eyes, all the elements meld. Life is given to an idea, and a masterpiece is created. That was for my friend. Es aesthetic distancing is, should be observed for this piece because I'm going to use a prop that is going to say exactly how I feel. And I'm sure you will share this feeling with me. <laughs> Aesthetic distancing is observed.
I gon' kill him. I gon' kill him stone dead. Before he take food out of my mouth and make me can't even buy bread. I gon' kill him. I gon' kill him dead, dead, dead. I gon' kill him stone dead. Don't try to restrain me and hold me back. I gon' kill him stone dead. Don't try to discourage me because I'm on the attack to kill him stone dead. This Mr. Man, I can't give me peace for him. Every day he just keep teething from me. I go to the bank to take out some money. As soon as I come out, he take it away from me. This Mr. Man just pick your pocket and leave a big hole in it. So every little money you make just drop out of it and you can't find it. Once I go every month when I get my salary, I used to make a proper shopping. Nowadays, I have to cut back because every dollar you spend is like they just go flying. Poof, poof. Gone with the wind. And you can't see a thing what you're buying. So I can't buy the things I used to buy because he carry up the price too high. I can't wear the things I used to wear because he make the price are close to dear. I can't eat the things I used to eat because it's only in the kitchen does feel the heat. <laughs> like the other day, we went to town to do some shopping in one of them big supermarkets. We pick up a few things to match the little money I had in my bum pocket. When we reach the cashier, I hear the cash register start to sing ching ling ching. And when it spit out the total cost, I could not believe the amount I was seeing. I feel so shame I had to put back half the things I was buying. And hear me, those are not my belongings. <laughs> And everybody in the line start one big laughing. This Mr. Man teeth me money and embarrass me in front of everybody and disappear into tin ear. Sometimes you can't see him because he does disguise and hide himself in the business places, in between and behind the goods on display on the top of the shelf. He does come in all shapes and forms wearing a mask to conceal his identity. When he keep on teething, when he keep on teething, teething from me and you and every single penny, you think he is it? He like a hawk. Every day he just keep on rising and rising sky high. And like Suknia, he just sink it in there, you and suck your blood dry. And make you bath long water. From your eye. I gonna kill him. No, you understand why. Just to mention his name does cause me worries and stress and pain. I can't take it no more. It's hurting my brain. It's driving me insane. He's a wicked, good for nothing bastard who don't care if we go hungry or starve to death. That is why I gonna kill him dead, dead, stone dead with this sharp matchup. I can't deal with the high price increases, so I can chop him to pieces. The merchants and business owners does use him to rob we, the poor consumers, and then blame it on the war between Russia and Ukraine and all the oil producers. Consumer affairs. Ah, oh, you need to get up off of your office chair and come out of here to do your job in helping us to track down and catch this highway robbery thief and tie him up using the legal ropes to put him under tight and strict control before I take the line in my own hand and kill him stone dead and lose my precious soul. The law needs enforcement like Moses' law in the Old Testament to act as a deterrent 
against that criminal man wreaking havoc and terrorizing man, woman, and child in this land. You know him. He does steal from you too. He no got no mercy for neither God nor man. They call him Mr. Inflation. That dirty, stinking vagabond, worthless thief. That is the man who does push up the cars a living and have me and you suffering. That is the man, that robber, who does hold you up and make you shin out every dollar. So I hope you understand where I'm coming from when I say I'm going to kill him dead, dead, stone dead. So we need price control and force security to guard and protect us from him. Before he get out of control and kill you and me. Dead, 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 stone dead in this country. Thank you. That piece, that piece was not meant to be written. It was meant to be said. <laughs> Anybody else want to kill him dead, 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 stone dead? <laughs> a stone? Miss Wanna Wanna, a stone for him. It was indeed a beautiful evening. The work, the literary work, the camaraderie, the space, the laughter, the community. I think we should do it more often. We need a CFBC speak. Sure. I'm, I'm just going to ask for a minute because I didn't want to be the hostess. I wanted to say a poem. And, but you can't tell Miss Daniel no because you know she's Miss Daniel and she come with a sugar mouth on you. All you're saying is, yes, Miss Daniel. <laughs> you know, you're writing three reports. Yes, Miss Daniel. Yes, Miss Daniel. That's all you could say to her. A real politician. So I just tell her she's a real politician. And she offering is good, you know. Everything happened to you. She's the first to clap, the first to WhatsApp you, the first to tell you congratulations. So it's yes, Miss Daniel. This poem is about my beloved, one of her friends and myself. The gospel according to Miss Irish. I went to visit one of Ivy friend them because Granddaughters is holy powers and like the word is godly and we action them, the faith and the strength. So I lend her my feet and hit the streets and went to give she Saturday greetings them. Fling in a hi and a hello and how you doing? Praise the Lord till we meet again, Miss Irish. Lord, I'm tired now. I walk across the word reach all the way up your tongue. Me. Good morning, Miss Irish. Lord, I'm tired. I could sit down, please. Miss Irish. All work is prayer. That reaching God ear. Child work for your blessing. I didn't like when she told me that. This is not how I de plan to get my blessings, eh? I silent and watch and turn my face a little bit and cut my eye because she's an elder, so if she can't see you cut up eye, I'm still in that generation. But she could tell from my neck that I'm cutting up my eye. <laughs> Miss Irish, work for me blessing. God ain't so I gotta work this hard. Girl, work for your blessing. Let me tell you, money can't buy. Because whatever it buy, God multiplies. Your granny has taken a position of weakness, so your strength have to cover her. That's your blessedness. I've never been so tired in my life, Miss Irish, but I'm thankful. Tired and thankful together, you know about that? 
this Irish 70 something and watching me. <laughs> Girl, you're just born. And attending, willfully listening. So I just walk everywhere and call it a workout, Miss Irish. I'm tired, tired and thankful. Child, work for your blessing, work through the tiredness. That's how God tests your worthiness. Work as you're worthy. Work as you're worthy. Work for your blessing. No, we'll call Miss Daniel. Thank you, Mrs. Charles Hazel. And I will now call Miss Lavon Brooks, Dean of Arts, Science, and General Studies here at the CFPC. Let us welcome Dean Brooks. And As you are aware, it is our fifth annual poetry circle, and we thought it would be good to present some awards to some certificates of participation to our poets this evening in celebration of our, of our fifth annual poetry circle. The, some of you have been here for five years. Let me see those who have been participated every year. You have to write in here longer. <laughs> <laughs> because you have, you have participated, I've known you longer than five years. But I think pension, quite the pension, Jerry Webb, Hansel Manners, Tatum, Carl. Yes, so let, please stand. Let us give you all a round of applause. <laughs> Walter. Yes. Right. Now, this evening we'll present certificate of participation to all of you. And we really do appreciate the excellence them displayed this evening. Jazara, Andrew, we, try, we are going to try to put them in alphabetical order so you, you can know when it's your turn. Jazara, Andrew, <laughs> Heather Archibald. Larry Armony. Larry Armony. Carla Astefan. Yakima Coffee Basil, you can stand over here. Alistair Edwards. Kishma Isaac. Keon James. Hansel Manners. Linnell Bingi Paris. Crichton Pension. Candace Sequentis. <coughs> Lachlan Tatum. Shania Taylor.
Shania Taylor and Shadi Taylor. Numero Unoma. Walter Morton, Leslie Williams, <laughs> Leslie Williams, Jerry Webb. There are some poets who have left already, so in the interest of time, yes. we will. You can. You'll have for the. You didn't miss anyone. Yes. We will. Yes, we will. Oh, and we, we have the... Oh. This is for Islander Water Sports. For five years, it has transported the poets from Nismith free of charge for the five years that we have been having. But Someone from Nevis come and receive it on behalf of Islander Water Sports. I was hoping they would send a representative. Shanika. We have come to the end. We are going to finish shortly. We have come to the end of our, of our fifth annual poetry circle in the celebration of our poets and the commemoration of World Poetry Day. The 22 poets were drawn from across the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. We had a poet from Nigeria, poets, po poets, three poets from Dominica, and we want to recognize everyone and we celebrate all of you. So we had a diversity of poems and diversity of poets. The theme of this year's World Poetry Day is always be a poet, even in prose. Words which were penned by the French poet Charles Baudelaire. He, in my opinion, he encourages us to write and to use our creative our creativity and imagination in the writing of in the writing process no matter what form whether poetry or prose this evening we witnessed a demonstration of much creative energy imagination and the powerful use of words with him and diffusing with fusion with musical talent on the pan and the drum. Thank you poets and musicians for an impressive display. The diversity of poets and poetry added to the amazing artistic expression. Today's excellence is in keeping with the motto of the CFBC, always striving for excellence. Poets have helped us to make sense of the world 
foresaw this fifth expose by emerging and established poets is yet another contribution to the literary advancement of our community. I am sure that you appreciated the different themes and rhythms of the evening. Let us now ask our poets to stand and let us give them all a thunderous round of applause. We'd like the cameras on this side of the, could the cameras come over this side and capture our poets? You may see. We are in debt. We are at the CFPC. We at the CFPC hope that the annual hosting of this poetry evening will serve to inspire others to commit their thoughts to paper. Like the St. Lucia Nobel Prize winning poet Derek Walcott, they can combine the grammar of vision with the freedom of metaphor to produce beautiful style. I urge or prospective poets to follow the advice of the Guyanese poet to not only sleep to dream, but dream to change the world through poetry. We are indebted to many, and so we want to express our profound note of thanks to all. Poets, our appreciative audience, live and virtual. Let us give them a round of applause. The Department of Culture, St. Kitts for the provision of ground transportation, Dean Brooks for distributing the certificates, CFPC IT Department for live streaming, the ever willing of Let Benjamin, the custodial staff, the Education Media Unit, the CFPC Library team, especially Ms. Wyatt, who was responsible for decorations. Stand and take a bow, Ms. Wyatt. <laughs> Our vibrant, vivacious chairperson, Ms. Michelina Chata, and poet. Awesome. Stand and take a bow. <laughs> Ms. Wanda Hughes, acting vice president of academic and student affairs, and Dr. Moyer. Rotham, acting president of the Clarence Fitzroy Bryan College for their support as always. Also the chair of the Board of Governors, Dr. Tamu Brown, and Vinyl Arts. We, th we thank all of you for your present, your participation, and your contributions for partnerships matter. matter. We look forward to your continued support. And as I close, I would like to extend to you a gracious invitation to our World Book Day event on a Monday, April 24th. World Book and Copyright Day will be celebrated on April 23rd. And on April 24th, the following day, the Monday, we will have an author's round table we can will really hear from five of our published authors. We invite you to come back and share this evening with us. Please save the date. Monday, April 24th. Thank you all for this e making this evening possible. Safe journey home. Do you enjoy the refreshments? which we have prepared for you. Thanks to one and all. Thank you. And we want to thank Mrs.